scientist by training. Uh, I, my background is in malaria research. I did my PhD on malaria vaccines and um, really fell in love with the idea of clinical translation, how it is that discoveries move beyond the bench towards the patient. And throughout my career, I've kind of moved from academic research, pipetting things in the lab, uh, through to looking at clinical trials, through to looking at biotech companies and how they do early stage innovation. And now I find myself, you know, at the very end of the innovation cycle, working at GSK. My role there is I'm the medical lead for COVID therapeutics. So two years ago, I joined uh, GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. They're uh, one of the biggest vaccine companies in the world. In fact, I think uh, one in four children will receive a GSK vaccine in their lifetime. And I joined the vaccines group because that was my, uh, my passionate scientific background. And, um, uh, but of course, GSK does more than vaccines. Uh, they have innovative medicines in other therapy areas, uh, in respiratory health, in HIV, in infectious diseases, and also in oncology for cancer treatments. But my passion has always been uh, vaccines and infectious disease. And so it was fantastic when I had the opportunity to join the vaccines group at GSK Australia. And then COVID came along. And like many companies across the world, GSK was looking at how they can use their science and their technology to help provide uh, potential COVID solutions and looking for ways as one of the, the world's leading pharmaceutical companies that they could potentially play a role in helping bring the pandemic to an end. And so they created a COVID therapeutics and COVID vaccines um, portfolio. And I feel very, I guess, privileged uh, to be able to work in this incredibly important area at this time because it, it really matches my, uh, my skill base as a scientist with uh, research training in vaccines and immunology of uh, emerging infectious diseases uh, and also provides an opportunity to really um, put my skills um, and, uh, and, my, and my passion into an area which is just such an incredible unmet need in our world at the moment. Even though I've left academic research, I very much regard myself as a scientist and I'll introduce people and say that I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist who works in industry and I work in a really fantastic area uh, inside the, uh, the medicines industry called medical affairs. Um, most pharmaceutical companies such as GSK have a medical affairs uh, department and it's full of scientists. There's people there with undergraduate degrees, with master's degrees, with PhDs, with medical degrees from all different backgrounds uh, who are working in this area of medical affairs, which is basically the scientific and sort of clinical engine room of any um, medicines company, because they're the people who are the deep science experts and their job in medical affairs is to work on the medical um, in and scientific information that sits behind medicines. So in medical affairs, someone might have a job in helping put together the consumer information uh, for a patient for a new medicine that they might be taking. They might have a job putting together some of the information to help uh, healthcare professionals understand the science behind the medicines or a role in medical education, helping educate uh, healthcare professionals about um, the new and emerging research behind medicines. So really, I've never stopped being a scientist, even though I've left academic research. I love the idea as scientists, as creators, and um, of course, as innovators. If you think about the word innovation, it literally means to bring about the new, to, to innovate, to make change, to, to imagine and bring about a future that is different to the one that we have now. And that takes an incredible amount of creativity. Creativity, not just to imagine that future state, but creativity to actually bring that into being. And so I feel like scientists and innovators have to be incredibly creative because what they're doing is trying to bring about change. And um, in my role as, as a scientist, I've actually also really thought of myself as a storyteller, you know, telling the stories of science. I don't just do scientific research. I tell people about it. Um, I, and uh, throughout my career, I've always had a real passion for science communication. 
And uh, where I sit in my role at the moment, uh, part of my job is actually to go out and talk with medical experts, to talk with, with doctors, with scientists, with public health officials about the new and emerging uh, literature and evidence around COVID-19. And so I've never stopped talking about science. I've never stopped communicating science. I've never stopped telling the stories of science. And I, I think it takes an incredible amount of creativity um, to be able to do that. One of the most important things about communication is actually listening. To be a good communicator, you need to be a good listener because you need to understand what the person you're talking to or the audience that you're talking to wants to hear about. You need to understand what they know currently and, and where they want to know more, what their interests are, what their questions are. And until you can really understand and listen to the people that you're talking to, you can't really communicate effectively. So I think much of our communication um, in science and, and medicine and broadly, but for COVID-19 specifically, really comes needs to come from a place of deep listening to really understand what the questions are, to really understand the concerns, and then to be able to be really balanced, transparent and evidence-based in terms of being able to provide accurate information to people in a way that they can understand. And so I think that good communication really has to begin with good listening. The world's response to COVID-19 has been nothing but phenomenal. Uh, to go from, you know, the identification and sequencing of this brand new virus through to where we are find ourselves today with a pipeline of vaccines and therapeutics to potentially help end this pandemic in, in just over a year. It's, it's nothing short of phenomenal. And I think the one thing that I've been incredibly um, impressed with is, is the pace and the purpose to which people have really addressed this question. And never before have we had so many people, so much, so many resources, time and energy and effort all across the world being dedicated to one problem at one time. So I think that really for me, the COVID response is all about the scale, the scale and, and the focus and the purpose of all, all these people who have all come together. And it really is the collaboration, I think, that's really accelerating um, much of the, uh, the discoveries and the innovation that we're seeing. We're seeing academic scientists, clinicians, governments, policymakers, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, all working together in a way that we've never really worked together before. And we've seen some quite incredible uh, partnerships. I mean, for me, working at GSK, we've collaborated with another one of the world's largest vaccine companies, Sanofi, two vaccine companies who are normally positioned as competitors and actually come together to collaborate uh, on a new uh, COVID-19 vaccine that is currently in clinical development. But we've also seen a lot of partnerships with biotech companies and directly with academic researchers that's really accelerated the pace of innovation. And if you think about it, the innovation cycle isn't complete until you reach the patient. So not only do you need the medicines, you need the right policy environment and you need to be able to be working and talking with governments, uh, with public health officials and have everybody really working together. And for me, I think that's been the really huge um, contribution and just the thing I feel the most passionate about is the fact that we've just seen so much collaboration driving innovation. I think one of the incredible things uh, we've seen in COVID is the pace and the purpose and I very much hope that that pace and purpose when it comes to meeting unmet uh, needs for, for people in different disease areas is something that continues through in the post-COVID era. Uh, it's been an incredible disruption uh, to the healthcare system in terms of the global pandemic. But what I hope will come through from this disruption is really new ways of doing things, the ways we can accelerate clinical trials, we can all be more agile um, and more adaptive and really put the patient at the centre of all that we do. And I think there's been some really exciting advances during COVID, particularly around things like digital health and telehealth that I really hope will continue into the future, being able to use more uh, patient reported data sets, having more open data and having more transparency around data are some really key things that I think will continue into the post-COVID environment and also the collaboration. I think we've shown that if we all choose to work together, we can do things much faster and we can uh, bring products to patients sooner. So I feel that 
collaboration, as well as uh, harnessing new and emerging technologies, digital technologies, but also some of the technology platforms that we've seen come through um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic will be the things that will continue into the future. as a scientist has always been telling the stories of science and not just about my research but really celebrating uh, science and, and sharing that uh, excitement and my passion for science with a, with a broader audience and so about oh, almost 20 years ago now I got involved in a local community radio science show on 3RRR. Uh, the show is called Einstein and Gogo and it goes out every Sunday morning and during my PhD, I was on that show almost every week uh, talking about science and, uh, and sharing the stories of science um, with the Melbourne community uh, who listened to 3RRR. And um, as time gone on, has gone on, I've had uh, more career and family commitments, but I'm still on the radio once a month uh, with Dr Shane and the crew talking about uh, all the fantastic uh, science and research discoveries that are coming out of Melbourne and around the world. But um, when I'm not sharing stories of science with uh, the wider community, I'm talking science to my two little boys who are uh, really interested in things like dinosaurs and uh, robots, volcanoes and space. So I've had to expand my, my science repertoire to include those things. Um, but we are always one for uh, setting up a science experiment with making volcanoes in the backyard. Uh, it's always good fun.